Are there any commissioner comments? Yeah, I have one. Oh, George, you go ahead first. Oh, I just wanted to say, just uh, following up on our proclamation, uh, school is about to start here. Uh, basalt starts on Monday. I'm not sure when the Aspen School District starts. Two weeks. In two weeks. Oh, so. But anyway, uh, school will be starting soon, so let's pay attention out there to kids on bikes and crossings. Uh, keep everybody safe. And along that sort of a similar line, uh, we have, as you know, the pro cycle race is coming up into town next week. And one of the, um, one of the little um, benefits of that is that CDOT has done a tremendous job in terms of upgrading and paving uh, quite a bit of, of Independence Pass. If you've been over it recently from Lincoln Creek up, there's mm -hmm. a great new section of pavement uh, that's going to be great not only for the bicyclists, but for all the community bicyclists who, who enjoy going up the pass. So thank you, CDOT. And again, remember to share the road. Rachel? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Steve. And uh, this is really something more of a request for the attorney's office and staff to look into. Um, I'm sure we all read the papers today about the release from Grizzly Reservoir. Uh, into the rivers, and while the newspapers did their initial, you know, asking folks what the potential damage is or, you know, the concerns, um, I'd like to see if we can go a little further to, to quantify that. Um, you know, it just seems 20 acre feet, that's a, enough silt to cover one acre, 20 feet deep, uh, being released so rapidly and, and perhaps continuously could be really detrimental to the, the fish. I, I, I sit here and think about uh, restoration work we've done at North Star in those areas just to stop a few small banks from uh, continuing to release uh, sediment into the water. And particularly, I'm, I'm wondering if there's any um, established protocol about when they clean that reservoir. It, it mentioned in the article it hadn't been emptied out in seven years, so that's why they thought it was so much. But, um, you know, how do we get ahead of this so it's not such a large release at one time? And perhaps talking with Mike Medill of the city, he seems to regularly communicate with Twin Lakes and, and come forward with a kind of a, a united front from the Aspen community to ask, you know, what is the long-range impacts? How do we prevent this from happening in the future? I, I, I realize the... Um, quote, somewhat emergency nature of, uh, you know, dam safety comes first, and I appreciate that fully. Uh, on the other hand, how do we prevent something like this from happening again? So, Can I tag on to that? Because I was going to bring it up um, as part of open discussion. Um, I would like to request that we write a letter to the Twin Lakes, um, whoever what the gentleman's name is, was in the paper. Yeah, the manager. Uh, yeah, the manager. Um, asking for a better line of communication. So in the future, when they are planning unscheduled releases, or have issues such as draining the Grizzly Reservoir, that they give us a heads up so we can actually do a press release on this side of the mountain and let the community know what's coming. Um, I find it, unless they can explain to me that this was totally an emergency issue, um, I am having a hard time accepting the fact that they are dumping this much silt into our side and draining off the clear water to the other side. I think it would have been more appropriate maybe to mix up this so we had more of a dilution factor and flushing than dumping all the stuff they didn't want on the other side of the mountain into our side. Um, I know that this has impacted local kayakers, rafting companies, and fishing guides at a time when they had many, many bookings that are being canceled and there's an economic issue there for this community. Not only that, but when you walk the river, because I walked in this morning and I can't tell you how many visitors stopped me and said, is this the Los Animus? Is this the Animus River coming over on this side? And can I go in the river? Is it toxic? And, you know, we, we should have had a heads up on this. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Patty, and I appreciate you amplifying the concerns that are there. Uh, the other question that I thought that it raised that we should talk about is, um, you know, the state water plan is not finished yet, and perhaps uh, as suggested IPP, Identified Project and Process, that we could insert in our basin is that better line of communication. And... Um, you know, protocols for existing trans mountain diversions to be uh, adjusted and maintained in such a way that don't damage the west slope. So I, I think there That's definitely a is a tie in into uh, things that we can request as the state plan goes forward. And in one other thing, in light of what we have coming on our agenda earlier, is uh, I think this is evidences of the need for wild and scenic rivers um, that we don't have the issues for dams and reservoirs that, that play havoc with the natural environment. Um, 
So I'm looking forward to that item on our agenda. Good point, Patty. Um, <coughs> on that same note, um, waters from Ruby with different mines draining into Lincoln Creek, I believe, enter the Grizzly Reservoir as they go downstream. And there are, that's our Animus River situation where we actually have water from mine mines yeah, I can going clarify in that very one. orange colored water and some of that then is undoubtedly what was released down the river. Well, we're, what we're seeing here is more of a natural mineral process the mining industry over in Silverton at the, the um, Gold King Mine was a processed mining process for gold, which um, has a whole different um, chemical reaction to the heavy metals and the minerals. Um, what we're seeing here is probably more of a natural flow. There was a filtration process from ruby and petroleum mines up there before it hits Grizzly, but I'm concerned more of just about the fact of the sediment, the particles in the river and how that how that effect on the on the to the fish really and we have a gold medal river here and we just slammed it mm -hmm. and um, I'm finding it hard to accept that okay well thanks for bringing that up John uh, so uh, to follow up on that is there any direction to have uh, water samples tested I think we should have a um, I'd uh, like county staff that. investigate it and find do a fact finding thing, just find out as much and then re report back to us in a work session. Yeah, and if that to see if there's any, any steps that we want to take. If that includes testing, I think the question is where do you go to pull the samples? You know, maybe work with the city on that. And how, how quickly before it's all washed through. Okay. I definitely think that we need to do a letter to send to Twin Lakes if that board supports that. Well, to Twin Lakes and then the people who receive their water from Twin Lakes. Yeah. <laughs> Twin Lakes is just a holding company at this yeah. point. Thank you very much for sending us the mm -hmm. bad stuff and you keep the good stuff. Thank you. And one more item. This Saturday, the Senior Services Council has a booth at the Aspen Farmers Market. And it's in front of the Mason and Morse building. They have a, a booth there always that they let different uh, community groups use so this week is senior service council senior services council use of the booth and uh, if you're going to the farmers market stop by and visit I'll be there for part of the day and uh, I think it will be fun I'll come by and see ya <laughs> okay are there any other comments from the commissioners Okay, moving on to consent items, single reading. There are three different items. Um, I would like to pull all of them so we could briefly just tell a little bit about each one instead of passing all of them individually. Um, the first one is ratification of hearing officers' determinations. Hi, Jeanette Jones, Clerk to Board of County Commissioners and Board of Equalization, which we just finished um, August 3rd as our last hearing date. And I have with me Steve Hogg today, who is one of the hearing officers. And what I've uh, presented to you on your tables this afternoon is a revised report that is, I can happily say, reconciled and balanced. And so notices will go out this afternoon or tomorrow morning, depending upon how long the meeting goes today. <laughs> I want to thank you, Jeanette, for this enormous job and for the, the fact that you used our IT department to help facilitate in the booking of all these meetings and cancellations and changes and additions. And I know it's an enormous amount of work for you, and you do a great job. And I want to thank all of the office of hearing officers. So Steve, you're getting good at this. So we appreciate your coming back, and uh, along with Mick and who are the other? Was there another? Uh, Ken Call and Jack Messer. Yeah. So there were four of you, and it, it's a huge, huge job and lots of hours, and we truly appreciate it. And we promise next year we will give you lunch breaks. <laughs> yeah, I only usually take a half day, so I was okay. And, uh, we we worked it out. Uh, Jeanette certainly does <laughs> yeah. a, a tremendous amount of organization to yeah. get, get that flowing. It's, 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 it's kind of a moving target. Yeah. I can't 
And then also just to recognize we have the new system now where people can set up their appointments online without having to take up so much of Jeanette's time and brain power to try to keep changing their appointments. So I, I think that worked well and I'm, I'm glad. When you look at the long list of appointments that had to be set up, it's a, a monumental task really. It, it was a big help and hopefully next year we can move towards alleviating paper. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, well, a lot of paper. <laughs> just um, for the public's uh, pro process wise, the protest period has ended for your tax valuations that went out. And anyone who is not satisfied with the decision of the hearing officers is then able to appeal to our board uh, as the board of equalization. Or no, no, no. That that is what just happened. Okay. You all appointed hearing officers to serve on your behalf. Uh, the next step, they have one of three. They need to apply in 30 days to either the state board of assessment appeals, P uh, Pitkin County District Court, or um, arbitration. Okay. Thank and, you. And we do have our arbitrators that you approved a list. So that's out on the website for the folks to to go to the process if they choose. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Steve Hawk and, and all the other hearing officers for their efforts and their hard work helping me through this process and working on your behalf. And I'm sure the taxpayers appreciate these folks too. I think the assessor's office does a good job of, of presenting their position as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Jeanette, would you like a motion to ratify? That would be awesome. Need that, yes. <laughs> I'll make a motion to ratify the um, hearing officer's determination as the Board of Equalization. Second. It's been first and seconded to ratify the hearing officer's determinations. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Steve. Thank all of you. Next, we have a resolution appointing a citizen board member and that that person is a junior at Aspen High School this year named Anna Patterson um, to be appointed to the citizen grant review committee and we had a very delightful interview with Anna the the two high school girls who were previously on the Grant Review Committee have graduated and gone on, so now we're appointing uh, one more person to fill that spot for our youth youth person on the board. Would you like a motion? Yes. I'll make a motion to approve a resolution appointing citizen board member Anna Patterson to the Citizen Grant Review Committee. Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to approve the resolution appointing Anna Patterson to the board is there any further discussion all in favor say aye. Aye. aye aye okay and then the third consent item is a resolution of support for the federal designation of the crystal river as a wild and scenic river and john could you do a short presentation on that and Dorothea, if you want to come up and sit at the table, if you if you wish to speak any to it too, you could. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt as I move. Sorry. <laughs> I would it's insist like, on Dorothea. I just like watching her hands. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, the issue of of the advisability and the uh, and the support of a wild and scenic designation for a portion of the Crystal River has been discussed in the community. Uh, of the Crystal River for about, well, it seems like two years now. Um, a citizens committee has organized itself around this issue and has uh, traveled pretty extensively uh, to the affected communities and the, the seats of the various affected governments to assess uh, citizen support uh, or citizen opposition. Uh, the Citizens Committee consists of Dorothea Ferris, who's here today, as well as uh, Bill Yokums and Chuck Ogley. Um, all three are, of course, residents of the Crystal uh, River Valley uh, and have been so for a great number of years and have a unique perspective on the, the values and the, and the traditions of the Crystal River Valley. Uh, 
what the citizen um, group has discovered is that there is very little opposition, if any at all, to the designation of uh, a wild and scenic uh, proportion of the Crystal River, and now they are uh, going back to the affected communities uh, in the Board of County Commissioners of Hicken County being uh, the, uh, the governmental seat for a large portion of this potential designation and seeking to get active um, endorsement and support for such a designation. And that's the purpose of this resolution that's purport, proposed to the BOCC today uh, to request that the board um, support and request actions to take place uh, ongoing from the, uh, the various uh, local jurisdictions, uh, federal agencies, and the river district to support, encourage, and to assist the designation of the uh, portion of the Crystal River as wild and scenic. Uh, I think that's, that's the, a decent summation of the issue, and Dorothea, of course, is here to answer any questions and elaborate on what I've said. That was excellent. That's uh, exactly where we are. And I have to laugh when we talk about the Citizens Committee because of our involvement. I think there's about 180 years of involvement when you put the three of us together in all of these issues. So there's a lot of history and we have had a lot of discussions about, well, I remember last time when. And uh, so it's, it's been an interesting process. And we're still taking comments and incorporating concerns into the uh, act that will finally be presented uh, as a citizen's request for this. So your support is so appreciated because this is a very special place and recognized that way by, um, I think, 100% of the people who, who have seen it. So thank you very much for your leadership. Can, can I ask her? Dorothea, what can we do to help? Your support will help considerably because now we're going back to different groups and, and saying you know, they're supporting it and this is what we've done to support it. Um, we're at a, a transition point of going from jurisdictions to individual citizen support and hearing mm -hmm. people say, you know, I want to do something about this. So you'll hear that, I think, and it's just that continued support and keeping it in mind. I think a major concern is, uh, do we want to protect it? Absolutely. Uh, is this the best way to protect it? That's what we're convincing people of because we believe it is, and how do we go ahead and do that? So that's sort of where we are. If you need any help elected to elected, I think you just have to let us know. I think any of us would be happy to help. Any of the, certainly because it, it starts in Gunnison County, uh, goes into Pitkin County, and then Garfield, but Garfield County portion is not part of the Wild and Scenic. Right. There is support there, and we'll, we will talk to them as well and the jurisdictions of Carbondale, Marble, Redstone are involved. So as you talk to anyone about it, that's the support that we need to have. Great. Is Redstone a jurisdiction? It isn't. Well, it depends on which one in Redstone you talk to. If you live there, it's a real jurisdiction. Uh, yes. Um, and Marble is a jurisdiction is. as well. Right. Or two. Right. <laughs> kind of like, kinda like Thomas Thomasville, Meredith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Have to motion? Yes, I would. I move to approve to the resolution of support for the federal designation of the Crystal River as a wild and scenic river. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve this resolution. Any further discussion? Thanks, Dorothea, for all your work. Thank you, and Bill and, and Chuck. You. I'll yeah, pass that likewise. On. The committee. Uh, and we need to hear that, so I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your hard work, and I know this is asking the Congress of the United States to pass this piece of legislation. So, And if you have any clues big, about how to get that task. done, you let me know. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. See you next time. Okay. <coughs> next we have... Uh, consent items which are set for public hearing on August 26th. 
um, for individual consideration. First one is a resolution approving an IGA for Colorado community response with the Aspen School District. Good afternoon. I'm Nan Sundin with Health and Human Services, and uh, this is the first reading of our um, proposed intergovernmental agreement with Aspen School District, whereby they would perform the Colorado Community Response Services that we recently got a grant for. And so we're really excited about um, offering prevention services to families in the Aspen School District. And uh, as you all know, Colorado Community Response supports families that have been referred for child abuse and neglect, but we've screened the case out because it doesn't warrant an investigation. But we think um, evidence says that families that are referred may still need support services. So this would be voluntary support services uh, contracted by the school and with Picking County serving as a fiscal agent. I have just a couple questions about the language. Um, on the first page, it talks about the second paragraph on the bottom. The CCR target population determined by each site may include. Mm -hmm. And then if you read into the RESO and the IGA, it doesn't use the term may include. It just states that is there, should there be a may include or just? Just includes. I'll take the may out. Okay. Include. Because that is the target population. Okay. Just want yeah. to make sure we have mm -hmm. clarification. Yeah. And the other question I had is about the fiscal issues. Um, it is a $75,000 grant, correct? 10000 going directly to patient or client services? Patient services. 10000 right. for client services, right? Yeah. Um, and then, but then it talks about other issues of the um, so giving them a laptop and limit the sharing of costs, incurring debt. I just want to make sure that we're not getting into something that's going to go over and above the 75000 So we bought a laptop with the $2,015 for Colorado Community Response, so technically it goes with the program. Right. Uh, but we will watch, you know, the obviously our job is to make sure it doesn't, and their job is to comply with the right. amount that we've been given and not go over that. Well, and then um, on page 3, it under the fiscal agent agreement, it says that these payments will be made within a week. Does that come out of our finance department? And are they comfortable with payments within a week? Seems like a pretty short time frame. I'll ask. Yeah, I just want to make sure that, that, that that's something that the finance department can can handle. But I, I um, John is in the back. He could probably answer I would say that. Yes. Oh, oh, John, he's yes. hiding behind the pole. Is that John, okay? Is that I just okay? want to make sure we weren't burdening your department. No, that will work. Okay. Is that in the resolution or in the it's IGA? It's in the so in governmental it's agreement. It's in the IGA. IGA. Yeah, okay. page three. Okay, page but three. I, if, if John's comfortable, I'm comfortable. Okay. John Redman is yeah. comfortable. He's but, yeah, John's I know. Name. So confusing. Thank you. Thanks. Good questions. Anything else? I would make a motion to approve. This is a first reading, is that right? First reading set for second hearing on the 26th. I'll second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to approve the IGA. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Down again. Next one. And you stay there. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you move an inch. <laughs> uh, next is... Uh, Approval of a memorandum of understanding between the state Colorado Human Ser uh, Colorado Human Services and uh, Picking County about the Colorado Works and Colorado Child Care programs. Right. So, in order for us to make those programs uh, available to Picking County residents, we have to sign this memorandum of understanding, which is considered an intergovernmental agreement. And what it does is it outlines all the compliance standards that we agree to meet um, in order to provide the, these benefits to Picking County residents. And we do this every year. Um, I'm, I think at one point we, we, all, we had a two-year one going on because they had it amended, but for the most part it's an annual event. And it supports the Colorado Child Care Assistance Program, which provides 
child care assistance payment for the cost of child care to low-income families as they're trying to find work. And it supports the Colorado Works program, which is basically a, a, a work strategy program to help low-income people find work. And it helps them reskill and retool. It pays for some of their studies. It helps for transportation, childcare, and some basic, basic cash assistance. So we're really fortunate in Picking County. We have currently 15 families that receive uh, the child care assistance program benefits and we have eight families that receive the Colorado Works Family uh, program. So they're small numbers but for us it's a really important program to help people bridge out of poverty. And it may seem like a small program but I'm sure for those families yes. it makes a world of difference in their lives. Right. Absolutely. I would make a motion to approve a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Colorado Department of Human Services to provide child care, Colorado child care assistance programs, and Colorado works eligibility. Second. It's moved and seconded to approve. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we have a resolution authorizing the Community Office for Resource Efficiency, the Renewable Energy Mitigation Program, which we call RIMP. That's those grants. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having us. I'm not on it. Is it on Wi-Fi? Yeah. <coughs> so, do you want to give a just a brief description of what um, what the grant program is and sure so we're here today on the first reading for the resolution requesting our um, an annual appropriation of the ramp fees to be used for programs for 2016 and as if and as we have outlined them um, these funds will go to grants and we have a number of grants that would be funded this year, including um, the Anderson Ranch for $20,000, Aspen Ski Company for $10,000, the City of Aspen, <coughs> Ice Arena and the Ice Garden for some lighting retrofits, along with the Red Brick for $75,000, Colorado Mountain College, some lighting and retrofits and some boiler replacements for $75,000. Habitat for Humanity and LED upgrade in their new facility for $75,000. Rocky Mountain Institute, they're building their net zero RMI innovation center. We would provide them $25,000. And Ross Montessori, um, a 20,000, or excuse me, 20 kilowatt solar PV system and lighting upgrade for $75,000. And Sustainable Settings, a 25 kilowatt PV system at their new facility and a uh, methane digester and a, and a hot water, a solar hot water system out there for $75,000. And then the town of Snowmass Village, um, some insulation upgrades and air sealing and controls upgrade for the Creekside Apartments and that's $75,000. We also have in there the Inn at Aspen, at the HOA, and that is reduced from our um, presentation to you last time, if you will recall, we mentioned that that might become an LED lighting retrofit rather than a solar thermal retrofit. Jason has had conversations with the management and maintenance folks at their facility and, and they are unable to actually do a solar thermal system now, just do some uh, plumbing issues and some more costly, um, it would cost them a lot more to configure the system. So because they had submitted a proposal to us that with a number of items in it, we um, ha are proposing to allow them to go forward with their LED retrofit and reduce that grant amount from forty to $20,000. So our total request for grants this year for the Randy Udall Energy Pioneer Grants would be $525,000, so just a lowering of that, and we have that conversation. Patty? So did that 20000 just go back into the fund, or did we... No, nope, it just went back into the fund. It just isn't being spent. Okay, right. So we it remains in the available. Put balance. it somewhere else. Okay. Yes, that was remain the one question in the I had. You answered it. Yes. So sure. that's. So, so on, on all these grants, um, you've looked at 
the total project cost, the amount requested, the approved funding, and then you also break it down in terms of annual energy savings, life cycle CO2 emission savings, uh, and then the approved grant per cost of ton CO2 savings. Have you done an aggregate of when you look at all these grants of $525,000 that we're giving out to the community, what that equates to in terms of energy savings and, and CO2 emissions? Reductions. I can't remember if we put it in the report this time. A lot of times we do. Yeah, I didn't see it, up. but I thought that would be interesting to. Uh, yeah. I, I don't have the, don't have the yeah. report that we sent to you. I have maybe that. for second reading. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it just uh, it, it just uh, <coughs> coincidental that you're here today and you're we're almost through our day, and they've had a great uh, speaker program up in Snowmass Village, which is going on today and then t finishes tomorrow. And so much of that focus is on how we're going to be dealing with climate change. And there's all sorts of great ideas and incentives and opportunities. And, and I think Picking County with the city of Aspen, uh, with this rent program, is certainly a leader in terms of a model for other communities to, to follow suit. And, and we can sort of see what we're doing with these dollars, how we're reinvesting them into the community, and also how that is uh, impacting positively a reduction in energy use and carbon emissions. Right. We've in each for each project we have looked at the annual savings, but we haven't aggregated. But as um, Rachel suggested, what we could do is come back on our second <coughs> meeting and report that total to you. That would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I hate to be any sort of wet blanket, but I think you have to add in the cost of administering the program. Oh, I completely well, agree to, with you. To that aggregate. I think that's a good yeah. point. <laughs> One thing I really like about this program we have is we're saving a certain amount of energy and keeping CO2 from going into the atmosphere from these individual projects. It's, you know, a certain amount. But then a lot of these things that we're doing are actually kind of a prototype that other people can copy. Um, for instance, uh, the one that one of the things we approved last year was for the marble distillery in Carbondale, and I met them the other night, and they were telling me about their system. I mean, I'd already met them before, but I was talking to them about their system, and it was really interesting that they have 100% of their water they use in their system is reused, and they also are producing enough heat that they'll be able to heat 20 homes. Now, I don't know whether it will actually go to 20 homes, but perhaps 20 different buildings in Carbondale will be able to be heated from the waste heat from their process at the marble distillery. And that's something that any, any business could use that kind of idea and technology <coughs> to, to become more energy efficient also. Yes. And I'll just comment, one of the things that we do when we fund systems like that is that we put a provision in the grant agreement that the design for those systems are part of the public domain. And so now we have those designs available to share with, uh, you know, similar users that might want to incorporate a system like that. So that's ready to be shared and has been already, in fact. Yeah, they're sharing it pretty widely, actually. And, and, and the other thing I'd like to add is that their grant from CORE helped leverage about a $200,000 grant from the USDA. So it brought more money into the community. So. So a lot of your efforts are being leveraged by, to help other people do things and to get more grant money, so that's good. Yes, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing that the Northwest COG does with the Department of Local Affairs grant money. Part of the grant application asks about how you can contribute what you've done to the rest of the community, and um, it's very beneficial to get points, scoring points for your grant when you have the ability to share your project with other jurisdictions within Northwest Cog or throughout the state or anywhere for that matter. And it's all available online on the on the Northwest Cog website if you want to plug in and see what others are doing. It's a great it's a great way to, to share the benefits. Okay. Thank you. And th those are two factors that go into our grant review criteria, yeah. educational value and uh, market influence, so ability to influence the market. So yeah. um, that all goes into our process for approving these. It's great. And if the grant to Aspen Ski Co gets approved as well, 
um, we intend to, Cindy suggested that we go, there's a restaurant group and we can go and share the information that they learn about the hood that they're going to install at um, their facility. So, you know, sharing that information is Great. really important for us. Makes the dollars that much further. Yeah. Anybody, I'll make a motion to approve. Yes, please. I'll make a I'll motion second. to approve. I'll second that motion to approve. <laughs> okay, it's moved and seconded to approve the resolution awarding these grants. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to next year at this point already. We'll see you in a couple Very of weeks. Nice. <laughs> next, we have a resolution approving an MOU with the town of Vail for shared dispatch services. Wow, Good afternoon. I'm coming to the board today looking so for if you can board. introduce yourself. I'm sorry, Ron Ryan under sheriff here in I know you're not Bruce Romero, so <laughs> <laughs> Oh I'm sorry, yeah, I am His actually name is listed. <laughs> ironically I'm here on Bruce's behalf because part of the reason um, we're here today is he's having to cover answering nine one one calls today. So <laughs> ironic. Not intentional to emphasize the importance of this. But. Um, I'm looking for approval for this MOU, which will allow us to cooperate with the Town of Vail's Dispatch Center so that we can share our resources when we have staffing challenges in either organization. Um, 911 Dispatch Centers, are, ours is not unique in the challenge we're facing with staffing right now, but we're pretty much in crisis mode, primarily because of the size of our organization. When you have 30 or 40 911 dispatchers, it's a little easier to absorb the impacts of staffing shortages than it is when you have the number that we have. The time it takes to train a 911 dispatcher is about six months as well. So when we have these shortages, we're looking at into the future before we can get to a more comfortable level again. I know that Bruce is looking at ways to get ahead of this in the future, different plans. Um, but this seems like an appropriate way to deal with some of the gaps, in, at least for now, that could help out both agencies. Patty? I, um, I, I support this, but I have concern about the travel time not being covered um, and any travel expenses. So if I live at this end of the valley and I get called to Vail and the pass is closed, it's two hours, hour and a half, two hours. And if I only have a minimum of two hours work, because the minimum requirement is two hours of work, so I could go over there for two hours. That, if you figure it all out in the, the pay rate, it's like nine bucks an hour. And, and I don't know how is that addressed, because that's a significant travel issue for people to go over there, work a 12-hour shift and drive two hours back. Um, so is that pretty standard to not cover their travel time or expenses? Uh, I don't know, and I, I did read that. I did not have that specific conversation yeah. with Bruce, but it does seem like a two-hour minimum it is pretty shy for, for any person, but I'm yeah. not sure how they came to that number. I'm just concerned about, you know, I, I think we need to be supportive of each other, and I think the 911 dispatch person's staff will agree that that's a good thing for both sides of the mountain, but I don't know if there's any way we can address that. But just would you bring it to Bruce's attention that that's of concern that yeah. I just don't think that's very fair. Yeah, I, I agree. Perhaps something along the lines of writing into there that it's a, sh it's a shift you're going to, yeah. not just a few hours to cover. but Or at least cover their travel the time. If you work under yeah. X amount of hours, your travel time, because that, that's a good hike. Or a minimum there. of four hours yeah. worth of work or something. Yeah. But we can look at that at second reading. Too. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We'll discuss that. Yeah, I, I just have a question. You know, given all the advancement of our technology, that you would think that you'd have the ability to flip a switch at either location and have who's ever staffing bringing that extra staff right to that location um, to answer those same calls. The tower issue. If you looked at that or not. At some level we can. We have some backups in place. If our phones were to fail, we can flip a switch and they can go to another dispatch center. It's not 100%. Um, and radios are improving as well in the technology area. With 800s, we're able to talk more across the state. But we would need to build a facility designed to be more reliable to do that. And that is one of the things we're talking about. Maybe regionalizing dispatch centers is the way to go. 
we can pool our resources together, have one center that covers a portion of the state, might be the most cost effective and efficient way to do it. Yeah, thanks. All right. Do you, do you know how, what the status is right now, how many openings we have in, in our dispatch center for how many people are we short? I don't know exactly how sure we are. I know that we have five in training right now. We're trying a little different since there's five. We're doing sort of a classroom instead of a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but it, it's tough. The rate, I think everyone's doing well currently, but historically the rate of dispatchers who begin and make it through the entire program tends to be fairly low. It is a tough job, and it's not for everyone. Um, I could never do that. I know that. It's tough. I know. It's tough, and the hours are hard. Yeah, the environment is difficult. You know, they're, they're dealing with people, much as we are, at that worst moment in their lives sometimes, but they don't get the closure that we sometimes get by being there, and as soon as we show up, that, that phone call ends, and it's psychologically and, and mentally difficult. Do you have any follow-up things you do with to let the dispatchers know what the resolution of the situation was? Uh, we do. There's nothing real formal, uh, being the size that we are. Those of us involved tend to go in face to face and just talk to the dispatchers, and I know that they appreciate that. And if it's uh, very impactful to them or it's a large incident, we'll do uh, an official debriefing that allows everyone who was involved to talk about their role and express the impact it had on them. Thank you. Would you accept a resolution? Yes, motion? please. I would move to approve the resolution approving a memorandum of understanding with the town of Vale for shared dispatch services. I'll second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to approve <coughs> the resolution. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Are you staying for your next item? I'll be waiting in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have a resolution authorizing the filing of an amendment to the closeout of passenger facility charge, which has the acronym PFC. <laughs> Applications number six, seven, and eight to be filed with the FAA. Thank you again for having us this afternoon. Um, Dustin Alvo, Assistant Aviation Director, Operations and Facilities. Uh, here with me as well as Brian Griefe, the other Assistant Aviation Director of Admin. Um, <clears throat> Brian didn't think he was going to be here today because his uh, baby was actually due today. Oh. <laughs> is due today. Huh? Is due today. Is due today. weather it's, delay? It's still yeah. <laughs> Something mechanical? I don't know. <laughs> comfortable, I guess. Get comfortable. Have a cup of coffee or ten. Exactly. Congrats. Congrats. Thank you. So I'm here. I can kind of take it. I, I wrote this up. Uh, really what this is. What's that? I think that's cool. Yeah, that's it's kind of fun. I'm glad I was able to if make it here. If the beeper goes off, we'll let you go. We okay, perfect. <laughs> I actually did put the phone on silent for this meeting. Just oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> might have to change that. But um, this is really just a housekeeping um, resolution. These are projects that were previously approved. They've been completed, um, and now it's time to close them out. The initial resolution authorized uh, the airport to essentially apply for them and spend X number of dollars. Uh, the good news story on this is on all of the PFC applications or the PFC projects, six, seven, and eight, where there are several projects underneath, they came in under budget. Big story there is grants, um, unanticipated grants from primarily the FAA, but also the state of Colorado. Um, so good news, um, and we were able to complete all the projects under budget. Now we're going through the process of closing them out. These projects go back to 2006, and we're going through the federal process to close it out which requires authorization from the Board of County Commissioners to uh, authorize staff to sign on behalf of it and close them out. George? Uh, Brian, can you tell us what those projects are? Because you don't, um, you just give them by name, application six, seven, and eight. Absolutely. So there's a series of projects underneath each of the applications. For PFC-6, it is acquire an airport rescue and firefighting vehicle, a terminal area planning study, and then the PFC fees um, that go along with filing it um, to the FAA. For 7, it is a piece of snow removal equipment, um, a plow, 
an airfield friction tester, the truck that we drive up and down the runway to tell aircraft how slippery it is or not. Um, a snowblower, uh, the fees associated with that. And PFC number eight is another plow. Um, extend runway 1533, that was the project a few years ago, you probably all remember. Um, construct a connector taxiway between the taxiway and the runway. Um, construct a de-ice pad on the south side of the airport. Improve safety areas and the fees associated with PFC 8. Thank you. So these funds that, uh, <coughs> this, where do the funds go that we didn't use? Great question. So the PFC funds are a $4.50 charge on every passenger implaned at the Aspen Airport. That has to be, or at least how 6, 7, and 8 were authorized, is a reimbursement, so we have to spend the money. Um, so if we didn't spend the money, it's really not ours to collect, uh, if that answers your question. Uh, to take it one step further, we have on the books PFC number 9, if you recall, you proved that about eight months ago, so we will not stop collecting the fees. So we'll still be able to collect those fees to do the projects listed on um, PFC number nine, which is the environmental assessment primarily, a few pieces of snow removal equipment as well. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Would you take a motion? Yes. I would move to approve the resolution authorizing the filing of an amendment to close out of passenger facility charges on applications number six, seven, and eight to be filed with the Federal Aviation Administration. A second. Second. Is there, it's been moved and seconded to approve. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Thank Thank you. Good luck. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Next, an ordinance op approving the acquisition of the Arbany parcel for the development of a river park and authorizing me, the chair, to execute the necessary documents. John? Steve, uh, either yourself or your designee. So <laughs> we have that kind of authority embedded within this ordinance. <laughs> um, the, uh, as you stated, this is a first reading. It's set for second reading at the next uh, regular meeting of the BOCC. The ordinance provides for the execution of contract and any other associated documents that would affect the conveyance of the property from the Arbany family uh, to the uh, Board of County Commissioners of Pickin County. I have to say Arbany family because there is some work to be done yet to determine which particular Arbanys need to sign off on the deed and that work should be concluded by uh, the next regular meeting of the BOCC if not sooner. Um, the, uh, the property itself was discovered by us and we have a pretty good idea of who the, the operative parties should be on the contract but need to confirm that and so are employing the services of a title company. Um, the acquisition price is $115,000 and the additional $10,000 is, uh, is authorized through this ordinance to cover that very title work and, uh, and then title insurance upon the acquisition of the property. The property was discovered to exist um, quite uh, without the knowledge of any other party. It was a remnant that was the result of the conveyance of other property in that area. And this particular property is uh, underneath the actual river. Uh, it does come out of the water and lap up onto one of the banks, the bank on the east side of the river um, in the general area of Elk Run subdivision. Uh, but for the most part, it's underneath the, the water and is in the very location that we have determined is the appropriate location for the proposed water park or kayak park that the, the county has been considering establishing on the Roaring Fork above the confluence with the Frying Pan River for a great number of years now. So to complete that project, it's necessary to acquire this property and, uh, and that is the purpose of this ordinance. The kayak park or the water park itself will not only allow for the establishment of this recreational amenity, but will allow the county to call water to that facility uh, and therefore uh, allow the county, without the, uh, the restrictions of participation with any other entities, to call water to that stretch of the river and to 
better ensure a healthy riparian environment along that, um, that reach of the Roaring Fork. Um, it will also afford the public uh, an ability, an increased ability to access the river and enjoy the river, whether it's in the form of boating or kayaking or stand-up paddling, fishing, or, or just hanging out. Uh, the anticipation is that it will be um, the first of a number of improvements that will stretch from the county's existing fisherman, uh, Fisherman's Park, which is on land that was acquired a number of years ago from uh, the Meyer family, which is near the upper basalt bypass bridge uh, on 82, or the upper 82 bridge, no longer really the bypass, I suppose, uh, down to an area um, near Basalt Town Park known as the Old Pond Park and will probably involve uh, not only um, increased utilization of Fisherman's Park as a boat uh, put-in location, um, the uh, enjoyment of this particular site, but also at least one more site uh, uh, down the river to the Old Pond Park. Um, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to so the Answer. funding for this acquisition comes from the Healthy Rivers and Streams Fund? Is that That's correct. Okay. Usually when we're buying some land lately, it's either from our housing <laughs> That's fund true. or from the Open Space and Trails funds. That's correct. This is a little different this time. Okay. Rachel? You know, I just want to take the moment to stop the Healthy Rivers and Stream Board, and stop and thank the Healthy Rivers and Stream Board and John Ely and his office with Lisa McDonald for all their diligence in pursuing this. It's been a long time coming uh, from the initial concepts uh, to uh, approval for the recreational channel diversion with the uh, State Colorado Water Conservation Board um, to these land negotiations. It's my understanding this little teeny fragment of land was found under the river when we were uh, trying to, you know, do the engineering and design work and, you know, Pickens County does um, the right thing and, and notified the owner and taken all the right steps. So uh, appreciate their uh, cooperation on a, um, uh, a sale to us and, again, your consistence, persistence of, <laughs> of this uh, project. I would make a motion to uh, approve the ordinance approving the acquisition of the Arbany parcel for the development of a river park and authorizing the chair to execute the necessary documents. I'll second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to approve. Any further discussion? I would like to just echo what Rachel has said. I know it's been a long process and I know all the different Arbany families around in the, in the valley, and I'm, I'm really glad that this is coming to fruition now, because it's I've been in an awkward position that a, um, you know I wish I could go visit with my friends about it, the, Ar the Arbany brothers, but now now I'll be able to um, visit with them on a would be much more free to do that. So absolutely uh, this. I think will be an awesome addition for the town of Basalt and uh, for people who use the river. Chaya Valley. Yeah. So, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Next, we have an ordinance authorizing the board to amend a special use authorization to the lease agreement with the USDA Forest Service for the Aspen Highlands Loge communication site. Bills? This particular item was brought to us to the Forest Service. Um, this paragraph that's being added as an amendment is. Um, regarding um, indemnification, which is something we do not usually add in our regular contracts, but um, with the federal government, they require it, and so we have been adding it in. Uh, they found this after the fact and have said that we need to do it, even I, I tried pushing back twice, <laughs> and didn't succeed. So 
I'm advancing it for your approval. Um, this Loge site um, is one of the sites that we've identified for our 800 um, state digital trunk system when we migrate to that. This will be a critical site and at that time, which will be in a year or two, we'd have to revise the lease to include that. So at that time, they would be putting this language in anyway. So, okay. so th this is the only contract we have with that wording? That wording will be in um, it at this time, or is all the new all the new ones will have it in coming going forward right. from this time? We have our crown uh, lease expires with the BLM in 2017. Okay. We'll see that language then. Um, we have another one. I think it's Elephant. It might be 2018. So we'll see it as they come up. Okay. Want a motion? Yes, please. I'll do a motion to approve an ordinance authorizing the board to amend the special use authorization for the to the lease agreement with the U.S. Department of Agriculture or the Forest Service for the Aspen Highland Lodge commercial communications site. Second. Thank you. It's moved and seconded to approve the ordinance. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank, Thank you, Phyllis. Thanks, Phyllis. Okay, moving on to a uh, confirmatory reading of an emergency resolution adopting the 2015 annual operating and financial plan between the Picking County Sheriff's Office and the USDA Forest Service. Hello again. Hello again. Hey, this is the second reading of what is our annual agreement with the Forest Service that provides some law enforcement resources and Forest Service lands within Pitkin County um, in exchange um, this year the money amount changes year to year based on their decreasing budget uh, this year it's 5600 plus we allow them um, access and emergencies to our uh, radio system if they can't get their dispatch center and we also get access to some of their equipment when we need it such as the boat ATVs and things like that Yeah. You know, um, this item brought up something else for me for perhaps the county to take a look at at some point. Um, and I appreciate the cooperation. I mean, this is not anything to do with the sheriff's office per se. But uh, camping, say, difficult this past weekend, you know, just looking at how badly deteriorated the little bit of the asphalt driveway is into where it hits dirt road. And I've had to wonder, you know, is it something we you know, board would have to discuss it and, and get some sort of cost idea, but is it something that we could perhaps asphalt that next time we're doing a paving project somewhere up in the area or something? I mean, right now the Forest Service is starting to do a, a inventory of their campgrounds to say which should they close because they can't afford to maintain them all with the budgets that they have. And it might be that some small help around the edges would, would help a lot to keep that attraction going. Saw your officers doing the drive-through and, and looking, as well as when I camped up at Maroon Bells over the Fourth of July weekend. So the presence of the sheriff's officers is really good out there, and appreciate that. But I just put it out there as something to consider. You know, I know that sometimes when you have a big job, a little bit of something else is another four thousand dollars or something like that, and, and maybe we can um, work with them. We should also maybe include that conversation with CDOT since they do most of the road maintenance up there. Yeah, and the ones that are driving the asphalt trucks up and down the road. So, you know, it's just a thought and it never hurts to ask. Yeah. And it would be very beneficial to the forest. Yeah. Okay. In the meantime, we should, do, do we already vote on this one? No, no, yes. Can no, we, we haven't move this through? We have, we haven't having so much yet. fun moving them through. <laughs> okay. There's, um, now that we're on the subject of campgrounds, there used to be a <laughs> six unit campground up at the end of Snowmass Creek, right? right across the bridge on Snowmass Creek Road, which would have been, I mean, that would be on part of the territory that the Sheriff's Office regularly patrols. And that campground was closed many years ago, and virtually every time I drive by there in the summer, there are people camped out in the woods there because it's a need for a campground there, and yet now it's not a maintained thing. It's just like camping in the woods next to the county road and they <laughs> might possibly be on private private land they might be part of that's BLM land or they might be on forest service land but it, 
I, I was disappointed when they actually closed that campground, even though it was a small one and far away from others, and I guess yeah, therefore yeah, hard to maintain. Thing. But that just points out a problem that the campgrounds are really a great amenity. Yeah. And um, I'd like to keep them going as much as possible. If the sheriff's office can help the Forest Service out in any way on the management of Forest Service lands, then that's really what this agreement is about. That's helping with the security and, and those sort of issues, safety, public safety side of it. Um, the others would be other word, but you yeah. know, perhaps it's something to bring up the next time we have our quarterly meeting with the Forest Service. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we need a motion. I would make a motion to approve the um, confirmatory reading of the emergency resolution adopted 2015 annual operating. Oh, yeah. Is that the right one? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got confused with um, Phyllis back and forth on these ones. <laughs> um, the confirmatory reading of the emergency resolution adopting the 2015 annual operating and financial plan between the Pickens County Sheriff's Office and the United States um, Department of Agriculture Forest Service. I will second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to uh, uh, approve this on confirmatory reading. Any further discussion? Thanks Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, too. Nice to see you. You, too. Now it's Phyllis again. <laughs> <laughs> when are we getting confused? Okay, uh, moving on to second readings, which these are public hearings. First one is a resolution adopting an MOU with the state of Colorado for transfer of digital trunk radio, that's DTR, and microwave equipment owned and op located at the Crown Mountain communication site. Okay. This is the second site of equipment we are transferring to the state. Um, just for news, Monday the state uh, updated the equipment on Ajax successfully, oh. and that was all done. Changed the microwave antenna and all the equipment. So that's pretty exciting that they're taking that on and doing a lot of maintenance for us. So this now is for the Crown Mountain communication site. Same issue, we will um, they, we turn over all the equipment and the antennas related to the digital trunk radio system to the state. We maintain the site, we still have the lease, we maintain the building, provide them power, provide them backup generator and tower space, and they provide the rest. Um, and so this is, right now, our three digital trunk radios um, sites are Ajax, Crown, and Sunlight. So we have good coverage up and down the valley, so when we migrate to the system, we'll be adding up the drainages and hopefully having a lot better service. Um, at least we know that the reception will be better because this will be digital. Right now we're on a VHF system. So we expect that to happen and migration in the next two years if all goes well. So this is just part of that move. Okay. Yeah, I want to thank you because I noticed in the first paragraph you did what I always asked and said, stated there are no changes in the document from first reading and I appreciate that because I always put where there, I always ask were there any changes. So. I appreciate you putting right that right in the first paragraph. <laughs> I circled it. And it is a public hearing? Yes, this is a public hearing. Does anyone in the audience wish to comment about this at this time? Okay, seeing none, I'll keep the public hearing open for the, the other items here. And, uh, I would make a motion to approve a resolution adopting a memorandum of understanding with the state of Colorado for transfer of digital trunk radio and microwave equipment owned and located at the Crown Mountain communication site. A second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve this resolution. Is there any further discussion? I have one question. It's more for Don and not so much this issue. but. So we are allowed to transfer assets that the county has owned and purchased with taxpayer money in this manner without a public vote or anything like that? With this particular fund, yes. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Next item is a resolution accepting a grant from the Department of Local Affairs for Broadband Phase 2. Thank 
Kara Silver Nuggle with Pitkin County Manager's Office. Um, so before you today is the second reading accepting the grant for DOLA for broadband phase two. And the only change to <laughs> this second reading is including um, the proposed budget for this resolution. So during the first reading, George had commented on the match portion for the grant. So we included that match portion and the budget, which is um, an additional $50,000 from the translator fund to meet that 50% um, match. Okay. And that translator fund is just for the public's benefit, comes from um, a tax that Correct. pay, just, just a small tax, but a mill levy. Yeah, a mill exactly. levy. Yeah, and in 2000. And in 2011, there was a vote to use that same fund without increasing the tax for the research of broadband, for the research of expansion of broadband and wireless. And so that's what this money is being used for. Okay, so that fund is providing television service through the translators, FM radio. Right, and, and, re now this and research. On the, on the research into the broadband. Correct, and wireless expansion. Rachel? Yeah, um, this is a question a little more for John, um, but probably you both. Um, where are we in terms of status of having a potential ballot question um, to free us from Senate Bill 183 this November? Um, so we, we have notified the clerk so that we're on the uh, radar screen, so to say, in terms of uh, having a ballot question uh, prepared ballot language needs to be certified in September. I can't remember so the exact this date. actually just came up this morning. It has to be certified September 4th, so I'm um, planning to have a work session on your agenda for the work session next week because we need to back into that. So Now, one of the things that the board will need to, to consider is the, the strategy going forward. I think we, we know from at least our phase one study that the translator fund is not going to have the capacity to um, finance a backbone, much less a full um, to the home kind of solution for the drainages. And so there will probably um, need to be some kind of funding question at some point if the county is going to be uh, uh, doing this. And, and what I think we're challenged on right now is what is the scope of that? Are we just looking at that middle mile backbone with a private partnership? Or, you know, I, I think we need to leave open the possibility if we're going for a Senate Bill 152 exemption that we go ahead and, you know, if we're bringing infrastructure all the way from Glenwood Springs already, maybe a private public partnership isn't the right uh, model. Maybe we should have the um, whole service delivery model, which would change, you know, I think that the nature of a tax question. And so the part of the discussion the board will have to have is does it make sense to have two separate questions, you know, or do you want to combine those at, at a later time? And so that, that'll just be, a, I think, a, a strategy question, you know, concerning um, we're, we're certainly not going to be ready on the funding side, but we could be ready to say, hey, we want authorization to provide this service and, you know, whatever business model the board deems appropriate in the future. Yeah, I, I realize there would be that fork in the road at some point. And it just, and I apologize for saying 183. I guess I have okay. water bills on my mind. <laughs> um, but I was, um, you know, I, I, my belief is that we should get free of whatever uh, constraints we have initially because to my mind that would even affect what financial models we really look at um, at some level um, or without that certainty that we can at least pursue some of those financial models. It, it was interesting I noted yesterday and talked to Kara briefly uh, so I'm not sure if I have the details exactly right but I believe that it was the Delta Montrose area just received a 5.4 million dollar grant from the states for rural broadband uh, mm -hmm. expansion. And that wow. is a regional partnership and they're hoping to include Uray and Gunnison for some of this mm -hmm. middle mile stuff in the future. So I, I think that the more we move mm -hmm. ahead at full pace, the more likely we are to be able to obtain a, a larger grant. And as I think George pointed out in our last meeting, after we've received some of the initial survey data, 
that it is a regional project in nature and the more we are able to work through with uh, residents in our portion of the Valley of Eagle County, Garfield County, um, I'm sure that's why they obtained such a large grant because it was a multi-county project. But um, I just want to see where we were for staying on track. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Or no, it's a public hearing. Uh, public this hearing. is a public hearing. Does anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution at this time? Okay, see no comments. I would make a motion to approve the grant, <coughs> to approve, to accept the grant from the Department of Local Affairs for Broadband Phase 2. Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to approve this resolution. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Carol. Uh, next, we have an ordinance approving the purchase of the villas at Elkron Unit 3202 for the Pickett County Employee Housing Inventory and authorizing the chair to execute the necessary documents. Um, yes, this is a second reading on a property acquisition. Uh, as you know, Pickett County has a housing fund. That fund has been created through housing in lieu and housing mitigation funds. The, um, over the last three years, I believe we have acquired seven. This will be the eighth unit. These units are available to employees of Picking County and um, employees of Pitkin County, which is kind of an <laughs> odd distinction, but it's, you have to understand that. Um, <laughs> this particular unit is at the villas at Elk Run, and I want to assure you that <coughs> even though it's adjacent to the Arbany property, it's, it's not in the river. <laughs> um, but it's a nice unit, and we <laughs> hope it'll be occupied rather quickly. Um, the last time I was here, there was a question about energy audits, and I just want you to know that we're currently pursuing those through CORE, and as we know more, because we'll look at all the units, we'll give you an update as to what, what our strategy is there. Okay. Any you. questions? Um, I was curious, how, how much money is left in the housing fund after this purchase? Uh, in, in excess of $10 million, so. Ten. Um, and that's great. Eight, eight units, I know the time flies by. We're, we've been doing pretty well. Right. Um, and this, this land actually used to be part of the Arbany Farm. All the land was the Salt South and the, the Salt Middle School now mm -hmm. and the Salt Elementary School all used to belong to Emory Arbany and then Buster Arbany. And, and then it was sold off in pieces for the, you know, different, different things. So and one day we're getting two different pieces of the Arbany prop, former right. Arbany farm there. I have a comment. Yeah. I just think that this, not only is it a great unit, but it's a great neighborhood. Um, the proximity to transportation, to the community, to the river, to the river park, um, to the schools, to the the pool, all that, and it's not far. You can walk downtown, the library, all right there. I think it's a great neighborhood for a family, and um, I'm really excited that we are we are moving forward with this purchase. Great. And hopefully, we'll find more affordable housing units in that neighborhood. That would be great. We're currently pursuing that. That's Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Public hearing. Um, this is a public hearing. Anyone in the audience wish to comment about this at this time? Okay, seeing none, bring it back to the board. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve an ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners um, approving the purchase of villas at Elk Run Unit Number 3202 for Picking County Employee Housing Inventory and authorizing the chair to execute the necessary documents. Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to approve. This acquisition. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, John. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And Steve, I take everything back. You were right on the mark. I'm shocked. 
<laughs> I am so too. <laughs> well, um, yeah, uh, I think we're going to take a is five minute break sufficient. I think it's ten, 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 ten minute break. Uh, that will
we're going to start. Welcome back to the Board of County Commissioners meeting on uh, Wednesday, August 12th. Uh, the final item on our agenda uh, is an ordinance adopting the North Star Nature Preserve Management Plan. Well, thanks, Steve, and good afternoon. We are back on the second reading of the North Star Nature Preserve Management Plan. Um, I'll spare you the monster presentation that I did last time. And, you know, you guys have seen it, the public has seen it. And really, truly, the, the big changes from first reading was the big conversation we had about the introduction and really trying to make the introduction strong and trying to show that this is a nature preserve. We do prioritize the nature preserve over recreation and we prioritize conservation and restoration of the preserve. And I think um, if everyone's read the introduction, I think, I think we try to hit that spirit. And you know, we'll be happy to take comments on what you guys think about the introduction on that. And then you know, the, the other major edit that we made was the part about the future negotiation with the Forest Service, because a lot of the discussion that we're having is about the river use and especially the where it starts at Wildwood. And you know, in those in that section, it was section 4.03.03, is we amended it to add, you know, to detail the consideration of what we could do if we had, you know, some type of agreement with the Forest Service to assist with the management of that area. And so, you know, we added things, the possibility of permits for both <coughs> private and commercial users, you know, the, the talk about alcohol and potentially the prohibition of alcohol, and the noise regulations throughout this reach of the river. And so we really wanted to, you know, put that in there as potentials. And so overall, what this plan does, it sets a framework and it allows us to then implement all of this. It allows us to go forth, negotiate with the Forest Service. It, it, it sets up a great mechanism for us to partner with Healthy, healthy Rivers and Streams on the restoration and you know you how we're going to utilize our water rights how are we going to you know work with some of the degradation of the past and you know restore some of the wetlands that are there and so that's really what this plan does it sets in motion you know the the new educational focus one of the cool things i wanted to bring up since uh first reading is we have been in conversations with the neighbor just upstream and that neighbor is very interested in helping us with the education of with ACES and to really look at ways to reach our target audience. Our target audience is the river users sometimes and a lot of it is the younger generation of, of river users and he has um, and his representatives are here and they might want to speak about this um, during public comment. But it's, it's exciting because it's a public-private partnership like we have done on so many other properties. And it just strengthens the protection of the preserve. It allows us to get the message further out from the preserve onto private property. And, you know, really truly, we're very lucky through this stretch that you know, most of the private property owners, some, I mean, a lot of them are here. And, you know, it's been great to work with them all through this process. So overall, we're very excited to get moving on this. I can, we, we've already started doing some of the implementation that was already okayed in the last plan. And one of the big things that we're going to be doing in partnership with Healthy Rivers and Streams is some stream bank restoration this fall. We did all those cuttings that we talked about, and they will be ready by the end of August. And so we are going to plan a stream bank restoration project. We're in the process of the approvals we will need from the Army Corps of Engineers, and we can do two stream banks this fall and do a RFOV, Rowing Fork Outdoor Volunteer Project, hopefully on September 19th. I'm not going to say that's a firm commitment because we, we definitely need to uh, 
solidify a few of the plans, but for us, it's, it's really exciting that, you know, we're already implementing because the other plan allowed it, but this will really set in motion those discussions with the Forest Service. We already have meetings set up towards the end of the month, so we're looking forward to moving forward, and, and I'm happy to take any questions, and then hand it back to you for public comment. Patty? Yeah, did you want to go finish? Well, just a quick add-on, and thanks, Gary. Uh, when we brought this plan uh, through the Open Space Board, one thing that they had suggested is that we find a, an inspirational quote to add to the introduction, and frankly, in the crush of things, with that, that notion kind of got neglected, but I came upon something that I think is just perfect because it uh, has to do with places that you go uh, to restore yourself around wild things, and it makes reference to a couple of the features of North Star. And, if I can, I just want to read this. This is called The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. And I want to suggest that it, it could be added to our introduction or take a place in this plan. But Wendell uh, Berry wrote, When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting for their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Beautiful. Very nice. Very Seems fitting. To me he's I definitely he, think He's that. describing our, our preserve. Exactly. Except the wood, do we have wood drakes? Oh, well. Well, not to be, we haven't found any yet. There's some decoys out there. There'll be other cameras tomorrow. George? I'll just make a quick comment. I just wanted to acknowledge staff and, and all the neighbors, and, and as typical with, a, with how staff manages or goes through a management plan, it, it's very uh, inclusive, and this has been a, a long but very positive process. Um, similar to other management plans. And, and I think the updates that we've made uh, since when the original management plan was done in 2000, mm -hmm. in 2000, I think um, they've, they've really addressed the, uh, some of the issues that have come up in the last 15 years, certainly in response to the new and, and increased recreational use and to ensure that this area uh, remains and uh, is sustainable as a nature preserve. I have some more specific, you know, Michael was really adamant about the net loss language, so it was hard for me to tell how we have addressed that. Um, some things are in quotes, and so can you clarify that for me, what either one of you are? Well, we went, we went really further, and we, like, had a good conversation about it. The, the last sentence in the forward, in the introduction, I mean, we, we try to say that it's, you know, we want to take management actions that strive to restore North Star to its optimum ecological condition. And optimum is as strong a word as you can get because that's the top of the, that is the optimal, that is something where nature had its way for thousands and thousands of years and humans never got there, that would be its optimum. Can we get there? That's going to be tough. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a great goal to put in a management plan, especially for a nature preserve. I'm not saying I can achieve it tomorrow, and, but it's something where we're going to strive to achieve it and we're going to try to get to, even with whatever has happened in the past, you know, we have the trans mountain diversions, you have so much other things, we're going to try to bring it to its optimum condition based on what we can do today. And so that's going to be our goal, and that's what we're going to strive to do. So on that third, what is it, middle paragraph on the back page of your memo um, in, the, in the italics, it says achieving and equilibrium. Is that supposed to be achieving and equilibrium? Yes. Because I didn't know if that language was coming directly out of the plan, and we needed to correct that little typo. I'm doing a Dorothea Ferris on you. Oh, about that. Let's see. Achieving um, is the. Do we have? We'll, we'll check it. I mean, okay. basically. I, I can show you from my notes, right. too. So that was the other thing. Um, I really appreciate the 
addressing the guide, the tours, the the numbers of guides, the number, I mean, of, of clients on, um, and I think I know that that's still in the works, the actual language and how many numbers and all that, <coughs> and I know that you'll be very careful to include those users, the kayakers, the, you know, be they commercial users or private users. I got an email earlier today from someone who privately has used it with his, when he was young here and when his children are young and they're still young. And he totally loves that parcel. He respects it. He understands it. He appreciates it. And he has an amazing experience with his children there. And it's fun. And his keyword was fun. And he understands the need for silence and the no alcohol and the no boom boxes and the pick up your own trash and all that. He just wanted to make sure that we preserved some sense of the word fun. I don't mean loud, race, you know, rank. Mm -hmm. I just mean that it's. It's not so rigid and strict that people can't really relax and, and you, enjoy but, uh, and you, appreciate. Uh, you bring up an incredible point because we're trying to do that with everything we do because sometimes it gets very serious when you're dealing with management plans for properties during the glacier. You know, you have to get back to the point of why do we do this? And fun is you know, one of the main reasons we're supposed to be protecting this is because it provides a sense of fun for people to protect yeah. wildlife, to see wildlife, to play in on um, these places. And so it's, it's quite well, tough. Keep, all the time keeping in mind the need to respect and understand and appreciate. It's not fun that you go rip it up. It's fun that you get the opportunity to enjoy it. It's a peace and quiet and, and the things in, in Dale's quote, which I think are perfect. So I think that needs to be really stressed. And, um, and I know that we will be working closely with the Forest Service because of the issues, the issues, and with CEDA, with the parking. And, um, and I really wanted to say, in light of the river situation right now, it is overwhelmingly horrible to see what is happening coming through there with all the efforts we've done to keep it clean and maintain the beauty and now to have this happen so hopefully Mother Nature will help us out and we can clean up that mess that's been thrown in our direction. You're talking about the mud? I'm talking about so the mud and the silt in the river. Yeah. Um, that came as quite a shock to all of us. But uh, that being said, it's a beautiful parcel. I was up there last night, pulled in, got out, walked it up and down, took a couple or a lot of deep breaths after a pretty hectic day. And it's amazing. The, the reassurance and the restoration of your own mind, body, and spirit up there, and I think that's important to carry that through. Rachel? Yeah, um, I appreciate the changes that have been made since the prior reading, and um, I'm ready to you know, take comments and see if there's any other changes needed. Uh, the thing I wanted to, well, first, uh, kind of a random thought. I, I, I've read before that the definition of optimize it, is also not just fully functioning, best possible, getting all out of it. It's also the point at which, right before a system breaks down, <laughs> because you've you've pushed too much, you've pushed right. too hard. We, we so we have to <laughs> have to remember that. Ah, um, the truth comes out. <laughs> and then the other is that um, when I was observing uh, recently over the weekend, you know, as you're leaving the North Star area coming into town, um, there's a, a kind of a curve on a plane of the road, you know, looking over. And it's really become a de facto parking lot. There, there's like eight, ten cars there when I went by. And I, I'm not so sure that concerns me as much, but because they parked there, the people were just streaming straight down to the river there. And so it was creating new trails and new paths, and it wasn't really at the parking area. And so I think that there needs to be a way to begin to focus on that uh, problem area as is well. Is that more towards the bend in the river where that prop that wonderful property is with the grass? It's no, just it's, 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 it's just as you're leaving town a little bit. There's a, yeah. a bend to the right, yeah. and it's a beautiful view plane, everything, and the bike trail goes right, right by it, but a lot of people seem to just say, let's stop here, honey, and oh, you know, yeah. they were just streaming down to the river from that point, and so it, it needs to be looked at. Um, then, uh, other than that, I would just like to thank everyone who has sent comments, um, and there are a lot of concerns. I received one this morning, and it was fairly interesting because I think they were suggesting um, seven out of the eight things that are already in the management plan that we've been contemplating, such as no alcohol, no amplified music, and 
and uh, limiting the number of tours in the group. So I think we're on the right track, but it will take some time to dial it in. And I think this board is discussed and is supportive of the, you know, additional enforcement uh, that might be necessary uh, and certainly working with volunteers and educational um, uh, personnel as well. There's one thing that's been in the back of my mind, and it was something that the, the geological study that had been done and presented to us, and I remember the guy saying that the dike had been breached at the bottom of Stillwater. The moraine. The moraine. Uh, at some point in time, maybe by James Hopkins Smith, where, where the, it sounded like he had said, you know, implied that there had actually been heavy equipment in the river and had lowered the water level. And that's why I think maybe it was James Hopkins Smith who had done it to try to dry the thing up, but the, I remember the wording was that the dike had been breached by human activity. Hmm. I mean, and when I did in my mind, if we're trying to restore it closer to the way it was naturally, <clears throat> building up that dike at the bottom by placement of some great big rocks just to slow the water down a little and raise the water level up a tiny bit might be appropriate. And, the, well, and that's what what you bring up is 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 kind of a weird concept, but it's also what we're going to do is take you know we're going to work with healthy rivers and streams. We're going to try to get a kind of a charrette or some type of forum together to get as many geomorphologists as mm -hmm. possible from local area people who know this river but also people outside and try to get together and work together to see what's the best ideas to do, what alternatives can we do, and, and get everyone's thoughts on it together. And then really kind of, and, and what we would do as a, as a county, we facilitate that conversation, and who knows what will come out with that. But that's, the, what we, that's what's contemplated in this plan, and that's what um, both boards are going to be you know, funding for in the future is to, next year is really to bring that forum together, maybe do it with the Aspen Institute. I don't know yet. I haven't really worked on it. But it's, it's that goal is to try to get alternatives because, you know, there's a lot of ideas. As you can see from the consultant that they, the Healthy Rivers and Streams hired and the consultant that we had, there were two different ideas. There were a lot of different ideas thrown out. So I, I want more. I want alternatives. <laughs> And then we can really dive into those alternatives because they have implications for so many things when you do anything on that river. So yeah. I think we have a lot of work ahead of us. Definitely. You know, that's why we didn't put anything in that we're doing it tomorrow with a weir or modeling or anything that we're going to do this. We're going to kind of really work together to find alternatives for rewetting North Star in some fashion. Yeah, and I just wanted to bring that up now because it's been it pops out of my head every now and then, and I didn't want that idea to be lost as one potential action step to take in the future. I, I agree with your concept that we all want to move this forward now, and this sounds very much like um, what Sharon Clark with the Roaring Fork Conservancy had put together for uh, studying the coal basin sediment problems going into the crystal and really kind of stepping back and, and asking folks who really deal with this all the time, what are the different alternatives and things. And then, of course, we have to screen them through the legal processes mm -hmm. because anything mm -hmm. that slows down the flow of water now can be considered an impoundment that you need a water right for and, mm -hmm. and, and issues surrounding water law. So it is complex, and I appreciate you taking the time and getting the right experts in the room, and, and uh, certainly make sure you have a few water lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> we will do that. Okay, this is a public hearing, uh, and I know we have the video presentation, and I, I think we'll probably do that first, yeah. and then after the video, then any, any or other or members no. of the audience who want to uh, make comments, you'll be allow, allowed to do that. Can you hit the mic? Yep. And this video was made by... Who wants to introduce it? Oh, 
Meant by uh, Friends of uh, North Star Nature Preserve, group of uh, 10 of us. Great, thank you. So this is, this is a great example right here of why North Star is such rich habitat because it's like a patchwork of these different ecosystem types all converging and where the edges of those ecosystems meet up, you have extra richness and abundance in, in wildlife species. It's sensitive elk calving area, elk migration area, and then the ground nesting birds really require this this type of large, undisturbed habitat uh, for nesting success. So that's kind of the premise on which this um, preserve was initially created and the management design for it. And there is a heron, a heronry, a group of heron nests just upstream from where we are now. And um, the river flows right under those nests. And they've been watched very carefully. They're monitored carefully. And there's definitely concern over whether the um, activity on the river, the number of people, and then also the the noise factor um, might affect the heron. I mean, if you've only got two percent riparian habitat, that seems a pretty strong case for yes. protecting it. Yes, yes, definitely. It's um, wetlands, streamside habitat is uh, very precious. Very precious. If there is a little rock, it needs to be the size of your inside your hand. If it's a big rock, there might be a bug that lives under it. He's so cute. Large scrap. Oh, there's a bug. Oh, you're the roly poly. <laughs> Way too
Spent money spent, right? <laughs> That's right, Jim. All public. So, Jim, do you want to do your comments next? You could be the next speaker. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have any comments. Do you have any? This is amazing. <laughs> and the problem is that I sit here with my hearing aids, you know, and I can't hear anybody hardly talk. I can't. And I was wondering what Patty was saying about fun. Fun. Well, you should hear what Gary said about fun. We cannot forget that. People still need to, with some, you know, respect and, and, you know, ability to preserve that preserve, but people still need to have fun. It shouldn't be so strict that people go up there and feel restricted and tied because then there's no ability to enjoy. I'm not saying fun to, to tear it apart and party and leave your trash. I'm saying that when you take your children up there, it shouldn't be so rigid and so strict that, that people feel they can't breathe and enjoy. Did you hear that? Did I say yeah, I can out? hear you. I'm sorry. I can hear you. And I, I think there's a point, though. I did. Well, there's a point where fun is not, you know, and and th that kind of fun that you saw in that film is not what we're trying to, you know, like they have said in the past, 27 years of kayaks and not a problem, not a problem. But that kind of stuff, it, it, that 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 that, that it fringes on the. The, the fact that it's there and it's a preserve for animals and 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 you know all the rivers have restrictions on of how many people go on in all these rivers the Yampa the Grand Canyon I don't care what river you're talking about they all have restrictions on how many people can go and 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 so if you can put some really tight restrictions on how many people go there because those films show an absurd number of people with absurd pieces of craft, you know. And I might just add, this has gone to my, my head, and that is that if there wasn't a few local people in this town who had fought for 15 years to maintain access to Hunter Creek when that big money person, the big bully, McCluskey, tried to shut down the access to Hunter Creek to everybody in this valley. And we fought for 15 years for access to that access. And I'm, 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 I'm in the other side of this fence. I'm saying that limited access to this river should be really strict. It should not, not I don't think that fun is why you go out there. You go out there for the experience of the preserve and the animals and the blue herons. You don't go out there to have fun and drink beer and party. Well, Jim, that's maybe, my opinion. Patty, let Patty, me just we're, clarify. We're not have a deep, no, let me just clarify. Here. He didn't hear me. I want to clarify. I said fun, not meeting wild parties and loud music. I meant I don't want it so restricted that people get there and they feel they can't move, they can't breathe. That there should be an essence of fun and of enjoyment, of really respecting and honoring this preserve, but not somewhere where you get and you feel you can't move, you can't breathe. Because to me, then you can't enjoy it. I agree with you on the numbers and the noise and the beer cans and the language, but I think that people should still have the right to quietly float that with some with some guidelines and some restrictions, but I don't want it so tight that people get there and feel they can't take a deep breath and enjoy. Do you think that they should? This Jim, is not a Jim, debate, Jim. Jim, we're not having a debate here. Um, we want to just get the comments, and I know there's other people who wish okay, to Okay, well then, my, to. my last comment then <laughs> would be that I think that you have the ability to restrict the type of craft that they use. Because on the, as an example, the Yampa River, you cannot take a boat, a raft in the Yampa River that only has two water cha air chambers in that boat. It has to have four. And so, I think that the restriction on the type of craft is, is 
valid. We're going to be looking at all of that. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, my name is Terry Kane, and I own the property located next to the boat launch at 0060 Wildwood Lane. And I apologize, I'm late coming to um, this meeting. Um, I unfortunately have been out of town for prior meetings, and I don't think I have anything new to say, but I just wanted to add one more voice of a property owner that is right next door. Um, as I said, we've owned our property for about 10 years, and every year the use has grown and grown. And in the last few years in particular, as you know already, it's been quite a problem. There have been several times where we have not had access to or from our house with our own vehicles. And if that had been an emergency situation, needing a fire truck or an ambulance, we would have been toast. And so I'm really grateful to you that you've already been looking at this and addressing that problem. I am grateful because it could be a matter of life and death with all the cars that have blocked the ability for emergency vehicles to access. Um, and um, I agree with what Jim has said and what Elizabeth and, and Edgar, my neighbors, have said about the preserve that was been there um, and, and preserved for the wildlife for a very long time. I think it's <coughs> precious, it's rare, it's irreplaceable. And um, there are lots of places to have fun and, and to be loud and to party. And in my opinion, the nature of tubing is that the current takes you away from your friends. It's not something you do solo. You do it with a usually large group, and you're yelling at each other and having water fights and often drinking, but there's a lot of noise, and I don't know that that's conducive to a nature preserve. I'm not an expert in this subject, but that's just a layperson's opinion. And I also wonder when we literally have thousands of people going through that preserve a day during high season, if even our scent is a detriment to the wildlife that is there. So if it were possible to enforce a noise ordinance, I don't know if that's you know, the only answer, because um, we leave our scent even after we've floated by. Um, so anyway, I, I, as I said, I don't have anything new, but thank you for hearing my comments, and I am grateful to you for addressing this subject. It's much needed, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Is anyone else? I know there's more people would like, probably like to say something. If you could come up here and introduce yourself for the record. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm Becky Hellness. I'm the director at Wildwood School. And I'm Tina Person. I am the assistant director, summer camp director, and the driver of that bus that you saw <laughs> crawling behind. Good job. All of that. <laughs> she does a good job. Uh, we want to thank you guys for taking this so seriously. Um, we really appreciate the efforts toward trying to come up with a plan. I feel like Wildwood School's been there for 40 years with kids learning all about the environment, the joyfulness, and also learning respect and responsibility. And it's really hard when you're with a group of four-year-olds that you feel or being more respectful than, than some of the adults that go down that river. So um, I feel like we're inclusive, but we're just very hopeful that it can be regulated and monitored, as you saw from the pictures. I mean, pictures say a zillion things more than words can, and we've got to do something before we love this to death. Um, my, obviously, it's the same input. Um, we take the kids out. Uh, we have a parent who was a Wildwooder um, 30 years ago. She and her husband and daughter, who now is a Wildwooder, um, went around 6 o'clock and floated the river. They saw beavers. They had a blast. But they were calm. They were quiet. They could spot the wildlife. And that's the exhilaration. That's the... I think the fun, the fun that maybe yeah. you're talking about exactly. that doesn't have that, it's that awe-inspiring that you pass down from generation to generation. And that's, I mean, that's our mission at Wildwood. And um, it's, this has been a horrendous year. We, we can't even have parents um, come pick their child up without verbally being kind of accosted by the, the group, the partiers, I should say. Um, obviously not all of them, but um, it's, it's really been a challenge this year and we appreciate yeah. anything 
Again, we've yeah. had safety concerns because we've had to have sheriff, you know, help to get out, get our bus in and out. So it's definitely a safety concern as well. Mm -hmm. And with 30 plus um, three, four, and five-year-olds <laughs> on the bus for 15 minutes, I think it took us 15 minutes to go down that day, if not longer. They're jumping out of their skins. <laughs> so <laughs> are the teachers. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. Thank you for being Thank here you. today. Thank, Thank you very much. Does anyone else wish to comment? Hello? Okay. Okay. Um, <coughs> one more? Maybe there's one more behind the post. Okay. Um, my name is Connor Coleman. I'm the stewardship director at Aspen Valley Land Trust, and I just want to reiterate uh, the words that I shared with the uh, Open Space Board a couple weeks ago and that um, you know, obviously this is a big issue and uh, as the easement, uh, the holder of the conservation easement on this preserve, ensuring that the preserve uh, mentality and, and uh, condition is maintained, uh, we're very pleased uh, with, with Dale and Gary and Lindsay and the rest of the Open Space staff for how well they've uh, uh, tackled the, the situation and obviously there's a lot of answers that still need to be uh, figured out. I think that this uh, updated management plan is putting us on the right track to ensuring that uh, this preserve is maintained as it was intended um, you know, when it was acquired over 20 years ago and so I just wanted to say certainly a positive thing uh, um, on behalf of ABLT towards uh, the county and the open space staff so thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Dale? I just can't resist this, Steve. Jan Wolford is here, and Jan was one of the lawyers that helped structure the transaction, the purchase of North Star back in 1978. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> I'm Jan Wolford. Um, I, at that time, I represented the Nature Conservancy, uh, and that organization purchased the property and resold it to the county. And I, uh, was engaged in negotiations John, with Jimmy Smith. Can you put your microphone down a little further? And as I think it's been said, you know, numerous times, uh, Jimmy and his family were committed to seeing uh, the nature preserve aspect of this continue on. Uh, I think they recognized that there would be some recreation, but certainly not on the level that we have today. Uh, I recently had lunch with Morgan Smith, and. Uh, he was somewhat perplexed by the whole thing. It just went well beyond what anybody had anticipated in terms of recreation of the river. Uh, so I think your proposed uh, revised management plan and the intention of addressing those issues, uh, not to, to eliminate recreation, but to uh, tamp it down consistent with the nature preserve uh, aspect of the property is what you should do. And, uh, and thank you very much. And, appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak and encourage you to adopt the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, and we're pleased to have you here today. Okay, anybody else wishing to speak? Anyone behind the post we can't mm -hmm. see? <laughs> okay, I, okay, I will close the public hearing at this time and bring it back to the board. Yeah, I just want to again say, and, and I like the Wild Wooders comment about that's the essence of fun that I was talking about. And it reminded me that in the summer of 2000, I was working on the original master or management plan. Nick Ireland and I would meet out at the senior center with a group of people. It was a interesting experience. It took a long time, but we got to where that 2000 management plan is, was, is, and evolved into this new management plan. I floated the river with my son and my daughter and my husband. It was quiet. We had no beer. We had no music. We enjoyed it. There was barbed wire fences still across the river. It was pretty rustic. It was beautiful. My son was probably 14, almost 15, my daughter 11 or 12. That's the kind of fun I want families and people to still be able to enjoy, to see that interior of North Star that you can't see from the road or the bike path, 
that you can really appreciate the value and the preservation and the habitat and the wildlife and the clear, wa clear water, which w will be again soon, um, and, and all of that. And I think that evolves in our younger generations, hopefully, the, the, the qualities that we want them to hold for preserving parcels like North Star. And that's, to me, the fun of it. And I support the plan, the openness, the, our ability to really look at the parking issues, to work with the Forest Service, to work with CDOT, to get to where we need to be. Rachel? Um, yeah, thank you, Patty, Thanks. for those comments. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for being here, everyone who's contributed to this plan. And it's um, been a very open process, and I think it's evolved really well. Um, there's no question that everyone in this community has either a, a link Great or a passion or, or concern about the area, the wildlife, and the river. And uh, I think we've come a long way. I, I will ask you this, Gary. During the last meeting, we um, expanded the uh, management portion, enforcement on here, to, to be able to leave it a little open-ended that the types of ways in which we would pursue enforcement and preservation of those values would be expanded and, and evolve over time. So we're not limited to a single set of what works in this document today. And so that's everything from further negotiations and discussions with the Forest Service because the put-in is Forest Service property. And so we haven't had the control over that we might like. It's not considered a formal put-in by them, but uh, we're going to work in partnership with them to be able to develop some better systems and, and better understanding. We also need to work with CDOT in terms of where people come off the river on the road and things like that. So there are constraints that we have, as much as Princeton County likes to be a little bit of a controlling county at times on land use and activities, um, you know, the waters of the Colorado belong to all Coloradans. And so as long as they've had legal access to get into those waters, it can be very challenging to, uh, to um, police and enforce those. But I think the more we put our, our minds to it and work on it, we should be able to get there. Um, and especially, you know, the things that have come up before, which were in full agreement, the banning of amplified music, the banning of alcohol, the limiting of group sizes, and the permitting necessary to do a, any sort of organized float limited, again, to, to six people. Um, I've heard some good ideas here today that we need to continue to explore, um, particularly the uh, type of craft. I think that that might really uh, limit it in some ways. You know, th some of those things look like pool, pool, definitely pool floats as opposed to river floats. Um, you know, I'm not willing to say it can only be kayaks and stand-up paddle boarders and no tubes at this point in time, but that th that is a, another control mechanism that could be considered is a type of craft. Um, I think this video was incredibly well done, and I just want to thank the people, and I'm sure we all do, who created that. Um, if you haven't already, I would really encourage you to get it on Grassroots TV and uh, be able to be able to see it playing locally. Uh, we could probably get it on the Picking County website as well uh, so that uh, folks know um, the pros and the cons and, and what's not, not really allowed. Um, this is all going to come down to enforcement and finding a way that the, the bad apples or the bad characters um, are, are ticketed and it becomes known you'll be ticketed and, and then, um, you know, people refrain. You know, as long as you kind of let something go, oh, that's the rules, but who cares? Um, and, and not that we've been in that mode, but that obviously we need more, you know, and that's been coming one of the issues with a, a lot of our tremendous open space acquisitions and preservation of character. The, the more you have, the more you need to spend on taking care of it um, and unfortunately policing it. Um, so, you know, I'd like to have us look at things such as even having a contract with a uh, tow, tow truck company that uh, would, would could be either regularly patrol up there or they'd be on call if anybody, whether it's the Wildwood School personnel or anyone else calls to say there's cars parked uh, outside of the very limited parking area, and they need to be towed now. And I think that that's, that would be start to be a pretty effective um, tool in and of itself. Um, so I also will go weigh in on the language uh, <laughs> issue. I think that the term enjoyment, as people used, is a little more uh, contained 
and fun, fun. Fun, fun starts to sound a little a little much. And I know I know totally the spirit <laughs> in which you meant it. And I think you're absolutely right. But it, it, we're looking for the enjoyment in the essence of a nature preserve, and enjoyment in what it is, and not trying to make it into something else. And so I think that that uh, will take us a long way. Um, certainly in agreement with the noise ordinance and things like that. And, you know, you hate to say it, but we're getting more tech-oriented, and there may be, you know, we've got the video camera out there to see the animal cam, to see the moose, and we're now going to be watching the herons on a heron cam. You know, there might be a point in time in which um, a noise meter is appropriate or, or other technological management tools, and that's something that evolves. And I think, you know, because it's either that or have a ranger there you know, five months, four or five months a year, and uh, that that could be um, an undue expense. But it, perhaps it, just starting out at that level of a, a, a ranger for North Star, and as uh, things come back under control and are are are, are well uh, familiarized, the public becomes more familiarized as well as the concierges and hotels. I think we should consider doing a flyer to those folks as well to say these are the rules here, and you may have already done that, you know, in, in terms of some <laughs> conversations. But um, and we have talked about updated signage um, that the signage is it's it's beautiful now, but it it may be you know sometimes it's the old advertising adage you want more white space and less words so that people really read the message, and we're going to try to uh, work with those sort of methods as well. So. Uh, that's all I have to say on it, and I'm going to um, uh, support it going forward. Steve, I have a really short addition. In listening to Rachel and thinking about what Jim said, I have just very simple. It's a matter of you respect it, and we will respect you. Yeah. Would, uh, would you accept the motion? Oh, yes. Sure. I would like to make a motion adopting the North Star Nature Preserve Management Plan. I will second that motion. And I'll third that motion. <laughs> uh, and it's been moved and seconded to approve the management plan. Any further comments? I want to thank and, everybody again. And I have, I have comments. I haven't made mine yet. <laughs> There's a stretch of the river. I've never floated down North Star. I don't know if I ever will. But I have floated down many rivers, and there's a stretch of river. We went clear from Sweetwater Creek, clear to Bear Ranch, <coughs> down the Colorado River on canoes. And there's, from the bridge by Dot Cerro down to Bear Ranch, is like a nature preserve, maybe not designated, but there are so many water birds along that stretch of river. And you're right next to I-70, and you don't even realize I-70 is there. It's an incredible experience just going down there quietly and we saw herons and all kinds of species of ducks and geese and dippers and all sorts of things and it was just an incredible experience and I've only done that done that once in our canoe but um, floating down a river to just be quiet and observing wildlife it can be an incredible experience. And I wrote down the word recreation while we were talking <laughs> about the word fun. Uh, the word recreation, if you, if you just put a hyphen after the re and make it recreation, to me is, is the kind of enjoyment I would get out of a place like this. You, you go there to like renew your spirit and um, get get your batteries recharged by kind of becoming part of the creation again. So going back to our roots of, you know, the humans are one of the species of animals on the earth and, and you'd be, go there and be quiet and just be part of nature and not try to overwhelm it with recreation <laughs> like we saw in the film. Um, so if people can think of it as recreation instead of recreation, I think that would be good. Also, I'd like to mention Bob Lewis, who um, he was my wife Molly's first boss when she moved here in 1975, and she worked at Wildwood School for two years. And just the the spirit and energy that Bob Lewis put into you know trying to preserve the 
Independence Pass corridor and having his home there on next to the North Star Preserve where he didn't even have a driveway into his house. He parked up by the road and walked down to his house and things like that. And I, I just wanted to remember him today because I think um, he's probably here with us in spirit today. And uh, so any further discussion by the board or comments? I'll call a question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Good job. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you again for coming. We'll keep comment. you updated on, because we're going to start, we've we already started a lot of the things that you put in this plan. And then that'll come back to us for review when we get Well, you're going to see the budget this coming year, and the budget's going to have rangers. And but some of the restrictions, lot. though, the numbers and sizes and all. Yes, when that right. starts getting finalized, we'll get that right. too. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you again, everybody. So do we need so, a motion to go into executive session? Um, let's see. We, we still actually have uh, open discussion oh. mm -hmm. on the agenda. And if all of you can leave quietly, you're free to stay. We'll, <laughs> we're going to go into executive session in a few minutes. But if you could leave quietly, we're going to continue meeting here. Thank you all for being here today. It's nice to see Rebecca on the film, Austin. <laughs> so, do we have any? We could wait a minute, I guess, to let it quiet down. If you can take your conversation outside. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the video. The what? The what? The drone. The drone? Was it a drone? Oh. That's all. We don't permit drones. But if we could turn off the the fan and the computer, that'd be good. We had a drone. Okay. Um, Every morning at 6 o'clock. Do we have any open discussion items for today, John? Yeah, uh, Steve, we had a carryover of facilities from yesterday, but uh, we decided to just carry that over into another week um, and, and not complete that update. And other than that, I don't have anything for you. Okay. Anything from the board? Can't turn it on, can't turn it off. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, the only Steve, the only one I had was again about the river, but we've already addressed that, so I'm good. Um, I did have a small um, thing. Mm. I just want to update the board to let them know that I will be going to the Western Interstate Region Board of Directors meeting in Boise, Idaho, in October, and I anticipate being gone from the seventh through the eleventh. So I don't think that will interfere with our regular meeting schedule, but um, just in case there's other other items. Um, I will be at the first meeting of the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging this coming Monday um, to get to meet the other the other board members and get kind of get our charge there. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, probably going to be back and forth to Denver sort of once a month or else on long conference calls sometimes doing that. So um, I hope you all be, be patient with me that sometimes I'll be not as accessible, but I'll always have my cell phone with me. And, and I don't know the meeting schedule yet, what day of day or days of the week it normally would meet, but I'll let you know as I find out more. I just want to let you know, too, that, you know, I'll be going to Denver next week and for my eye surgery. But the following week, regardless of whether or not I can leave Denver on that Thursday to go to the Northwest COG Strategic Planning Meeting and the Economic Development District Meeting, I can do it by phone. So I'm going to be there one way or another. Okay. Okay. So um, I would accept a motion to go into executive session for purposes of discussing open space acquisitions and the Snowmass Capitol Creek Road chip and seal, all pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024. Actually, the first item would be pursuant to 4A, 4A. and the second pursuant to 4B. Okay. 
Okay. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, it's moved and seconded to go into executive session. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you.